So to mark the International Day of Italian Cinema, I asked a few of my New York colleagues to share their thoughts on Italian cinema and culture and the impact it's had in their lives. So we're going to start with Lucia, and I'm going to have everyone introduce themselves. My name is Lucia Grillo, or Grillo, Lucia Grillo. Um, I'm an actress, filmmaker, and on-camera yeah, TV host correspondent. I am an actress in New York, in the U.S., and Italy, and I also make films between Italy and the U.S., particularly in Calabria. Taylor? <laughs> Ciao. My name is Taylor Taglinetti, or Taglianetti. I'm the founder of the National yeah, Organization of right Italian now. American in Film and Television. I'm also a producer and an interviewer. Really okay, and Joe? I am Joe Crisafulli, or Joe Crisafulli, <laughs> and I'm an independent uh, filmmaker, producer, writer uh, for our own production company, Zio Chicho Cinema, and I am the chief and entertainment be, critic for the I, National I Organization of Italian Americans uh, in Film and Television. Uh, a lot of the cinema I watch, the old Italian movies especially, are to learn more about the culture and to learn more about my origins. And so I found that films made in Basilicata um, are something that I really learned from. So the one film that I really think I have learned the most from has been, um, in addition to the Gospel according to St. Matthew, is um, Carlo Levi's book and film, Francesco Rossi's film, Christ Stopped at Eboli. Um, I learned about the siege of Melfi, um, how that influenced the poverty in Southern Italy. The thing that really captured, that kept the film captured the most was how the Lucani had the same spirit then as they do now. They had the same, that's something that's never changed. And when I go there now, I'm welcomed and um, it's a beautiful modern region now. But when it was, when this film was made and they were talking about, you know, during World War to the 40s, the 30s, the 40s, you know, all that time when there were really um, peasants who were living there. Um, the one thing that hasn't really changed is their spirit. And I also just made a documentary about Luigi Di Gianni, who filmed back then, and that's what he said, that that was something that was undeniable, was their spirit. So let's um, go on to Joe. So what films, film or films or work has inspired you the most? In terms of cinema, uh, I saw a lot of, of movies on Italian television, a lot of things that weren't available in the States. So, you know, maybe as a teenager, I'm, I'm seeing Fantozzi and I'm seeing Toto and, and obviously uh, Sordi and people like that. Um, you know, Sofia, whenever she was on television in my house, you could hear a pin drop. But it may be cliche uh, and it's been done to death, but for me as a director, as what I would like to think is as is an auteur in, in my work, really eight and a half. Um, and the reason is because it really opened my eyes to what a motion picture could be. Uh, totally not a formula. Uh, someone who's dealing with clearly issues and inner demons that are, I think, mal specific in terms of his relationship to women, uh, his relationship to his church, that monologue at the end where he's essentially, it's a confession to his wife that he, he basically wishes he could look into her faithful eyes and be the man and the husband that she deserves and he wants to be. And done in such sort of a, a free stream of consciousness that, that you're not gonna find in a Sid Field manual or a Robert McKee seminar. And I think that uh, unfortunately, in my opinion, Fellini sort of, um, as his work progressed, I, I kind of feel that Fellini, the man, was losing uh, <laughs> the battle, so to speak, and maybe just accepted who he was. And, uh, but for those reasons, uh, a cinema that is that personal, that can also be that uh, cinematic and that purely cinematic and exciting, uh, specific to culture, specific to an author, really, really uh, influenced me and the way I looked at my own work. That was, I'm so glad you talked about Eight and a Half because I really wanted to find a way to include Fellini in this. So that was perfect. I'm really glad. Um, I always think of just pa Pasolini and Rossi when 
those two films, but also Lena Wertmuller too. Um, the fir very first film I saw in this modern Italian cinema, because like you, Joe, I grew up with, you know, Sofia Loren and, you know, uh, Mastroianni and all that. So they were kind of part of my, part of my extended family in a way. But when I reached out to see the Italy that I had just left behind in 1996, I went to the, the new Italian cinema and Ciao Professore was the first movie with Paolo Villaggio and it was filmed in Naples. And, you know, you, again, it was the South. And so I think after having spent six months in Rome, I was working for CNN to see this South for the first time. And as much as, you know, you love, Rome, it's so, it's so magical. The South is a whole different ball game. It's, it's totally different. It's a whole different warmth. So I think that was um, also a huge film for me. So Taylor, what about you? Well, I just want to say I was waiting with bated breath to see what film Joe was going to pick. <laughs> it was tough. It was tough to narrow it. I know it is, definitely. Yeah, so, okay, I picked Bicycle Thieves um, because there was no other choice for me. I love, love, love that film. Um, I think it was the first Italian film I'd ever seen, so um, it's, it's just always stayed with me because of how simple it is, and I think sometimes when we think about, you know, the most revered films of all time, you know, we might look at how complicated they are or you know how ingenious they are for doing something really gimmicky and this movie has no gimmicks it's just you feel like you're watching a documentary and i just think that the whole message of the film really resonates now it's a timeless film you know you can have an impact on someone you know the whole point of the story is that this guy is his job depends on a bicycle and someone steals it and you know Maybe that, you don't know, you know, the reasons why that guy stole it, but you know, that whole impact that this can literally destroy someone's life. And if you think about the coronavirus, you think about all that's going on in the world of racism, you know, as an individual, you can have an impact on someone's life for the better or for the worse. And I have never, never seen a movie that quite was like it in just all elements. Even the cinematography is just so beautiful, the close-ups, and it's really just a film that I feel like, as a human, as an Italian, it's, it's about empathy. And I think that's what we need more of in the world. And I think that's why films exist in the first place, is that it just makes us more empathetic. It puts us in someone's shoes. And I just think, you know, on all accounts, it's just so, so well done. I, I just, I can't, I can't, uh, you know, praise it enough. I have my criteria. <laughs> The book, you know. We both you know, have our books with us. <laughs> you know, Taylor, I, I think that's such I, I think that's such a great example because the first time I saw Bicycle Thieves, it was during the Iraq War. And I mean the first time I saw it properly in the theater uninterrupted. And I was I was at ground zero on 9-11. Um, mm -hmm. and it you know that changed my whole life. And I happened to see it with a coworker of mine at the time who was from Iraq and he had fled Saddam to go to Florence where he started an anti-Saddam newspaper in Florence. And so he and I spoke Italian and he loved Pasol uh, Pasolini, uh, Oedipus Rex he, he took me to, but he loved uh, neorealism and bicycle thieves as well. And he's the one that took me to anthology archives uh, to see the Sika's movie. Um, and that was my first exposure. Uh, two guys who showed up to work every day, both drained, uh, probably because of our shared PTSD. Um, and he exposed me, an Italian-American, to this wonderful piece of empathetic Italian cinema. And there was an old lady that saw us on our way out. And she said, you guys saw Bicycle Thieves? We go, yeah. She goes, is it still as great as ever? And we were like, yeah. But empathy, yes, exactly. Cinema is an empathy machine. Mm -hmm. um, hold on a second. Sorry for stealing the time. No, 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 you're not. We're, we're good. So, Lucia, what is yours? I th well, several. Um, I know, right? <laughs> it's, hard. it's so hard. It is. Um, I think probably directly for my, uh, let's say my narrative films, my documentaries are other, but my narrative films that were shot in Calabria, um, I think probably Roma Gita Aperta because, um, because I call my films neo-neorealist, right? Because they're from the neorealist tradition. I just loved, I just loved um, the humanity in the neorealist films, you know, how raw they were. Um, but recently, I, you know, I, you know, Janine, um, 
but I think the general public doesn't know that I have a feature film and a TV series, an adaptation from a book right now in development between both between Calabria and New York. And um, in doing research for developing these projects, I've been studying more, you know, revisiting and then even discovering new films. So um, recently, a few years ago, I had seen for the first time Corbucci's um, The Great Silence. C'è un uomo che fa tremare i cacciatori di taglie quando lo incontra. Lo chiamano silenzio. Perché dopo che è passato lui, resta soltanto il silenzio. I love westerns. I didn't as a kid because I thought they were like dad's Sunday films. But when I was living in Italy, when there were only three channels still, <laughs> um, they would replay them. And it just, the, you know, the cinematography and the storylines were really astounding. And um, I recently back here in New York saw Corbucci's The Great Silence. And it's ahead of its time. And the, there's an interracial couple. Um, there's a very left-wing storyline, which particularly appeals to me. Um, the main character is silent. He doesn't speak. And um, I just thought it was such a great piece of filmmaking. Um, and then I, re I discovered, as you know, Janine, uh, just a couple of years ago when, uh, when it was restored, Rocco e suoi fratelli, mm -hmm. which has two new scenes added. And the film is probably, I've been studying it a lot ever since that first viewing, and I've seen it again since then. And um, it's probably one of the most devastating films I've ever seen because of its, um, its handling of the Southern question, you know, the treatment and the subtitles are wrong in that film. You know, there's a woman who calls the, the recent Southern, I think they're from Basilicata. Yeah, they cut the scenes out though, unfortunately, in the beginning. I don't yep. think they added for the restored version. Yeah, they added two scenes oh. and they're very violent and just devastating. But I think um, it shows the bravery and the risk taking mm -hmm that filmmakers i think you know if you want to drive home the you know the reality of things sometimes it takes that kind of risk you know going places where you don't want to go and um, it also deals with the class system racism from the northerners to the southerners one of the old women you know the torinese women actually calls these people from basilicata africani which shows how racist the people are right against Africans and against Southern Italians. And masculinity, you know, questions of masculinity, uh, love, capitalism, it's just, it's such a devastating, devastating film. And, um, but I think my absolute favorite film of all time, if, you, if I had to pick one, would be Il Conformista, The Conformist. Um, I think it's visually stunning. Everything from the uh, framing, the inquadrature, the framing, to the storyline. There again, risk taking, the colors, um, the the setting. Some of it is filmed in Eor, which is a really striking neighborhood architecture with right? the whole futurists who were fascists. But it's part of a film no one ever talks about. The, yeah. the, the neighborhood, yeah. Exactly, and it's just so, it's stunning. That architecture is really stunning, and um, that would be my, my probably my perfect film, Conformist. Okay. Um, I recently saw City of Women. I mean, we could talk forever about that movie, <laughs> especially with Lucia, because <laughs> there's a lot of... Um, and a lot of um, non-politically correct stuff in that film. But what, what really I thought was just so amazing was Dante Ferretti's um, set design. And I mean, the lighting and um, the direction. It was something that really struck me. I mean, it's, it was a 1980 film. So it was, you know, one of Fellini's later films. And I really just thought visually it was just gorgeous. In that sense, I mean, the, the Italian craftsmen, whether you're talking about shoes or you're talking about cinema or, or production design or, or the cinematography, uh, Daniel Day-Lewis is the one that said, working at Shinichita, that the Italian craftsmen are second to none.
Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, I think that, you know, for, for a teenage boy going to Italy from America to see something like that on television, it was, it spoke to, to your soul, you know? Mm-hmm. But the question is that I think Fellini, uh, again, really kind of struggled with is how do you translate that from uh, a sh- potential chauvinism you know, the sole truth of man, uh, certainly heterosexual men, to covet a woman. You know, men will never understand menstruation. Women may never understand that sole truth of a man to, to covet woman. I think what all men have to learn and what I think Fellini may have gotten a gist of is the ability to admire what you covet and to realize that the world is not about your want and that how do you translate this hormonal soul energy into something that may enrich the world instead of destroying it. So that's something as a young, as a young teenage boy, you're seeing something like, <laughs> like uh, you take your pick uh, with, with Fellini or uh, that one scene in uh, I'm Accord when, when the kid comes back into the shop and the girl says, lift me up. You know? <laughs> I was that's a like, I could have prayed for something like that to happen. And that's something that a woman, if it happened to a girl, it would be a nightmare. And, but those are the conversations we have to have as, as polarities, male and female, uh, that we have to have in society. And that's why I think artists in general and filmmakers can really be shamans in that you have an experience that you're able to relate to other people to uh, enrich our lives and our discussion. Mm-hmm. That's a good point. Can I, can I deviate for a second, uh, Janine? <laughs> sure, go ahead. Because we've been talking so much about the men and Wert Müller is, she is one of the greatest filmmakers ever in the history of cinema. Talk about risk-taking, right? When she made uh, Swept Away, she was vilified by feminists because they, or at least American American women journalists, because they couldn't understand. Mm-hmm. You know, the woman places the figure, uh, the capitalist figure, right? And um, that film is so important to talk about relations between the North and the South and racism and gender roles and um, and the North versus the South in Italy, right? Even in that, even in that, you know, in that, in that, even in that one aspect of the, you know, the uptight rich woman and the sensual uh, carnale southern man, right? That brings it up too. Even even in the midst of all of that, you know, talking about class and the, the relations between the master and servant. Does anyone have any thoughts on where Italian cinema is going? When you think about, you know, HBO picking up its first, you know, non-English language series being My Brilliant Friend, um, and that just doing wonders, you know, in Italy and in America and around the world, I think that people are really excited about Italian stories. I mean, HBO has gobbled up so many Italian stories. I mean, obviously, like, the new Pope, the young Pope. Um, I know this much is true um, with Mark Ruffalo. Um, yeah, I think, we're great. I think we're in a great spot. I think that as there is more streaming services coming to the fore and more outlets to share our work, as long as there's not too much out there that we get distracted by everything, there will be a spot for us. And I'm very much looking forward to Joe's film that hopefully, you know, they were supposed to shoot it this year, him and his fiance, Melissa. Um, but that's one film that I'm really, really looking forward to. Um, hopefully, you know, they'll get to film it sooner rather than later. Mm-hmm. Joe, do you want to tell us anything she about that? Salvation for Italian cinema is good in my book. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> thank you, Taylor, Thank you. Okay, thank you, everyone. Ciao, thank you. Ciao, Taylor. Ciao.